Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm, I'm talking the F Riverdale episodes uh, As Above, So Below, and The Midnight Club. Uh, <clears throat> so let's kind of get right into things. Um, of these two, I thought Midnight Club was the stronger episode. Um, <clears throat> As Above, So Below, uh, I mean, it's just kind of more of the prison drama stuff and... Um, uh, mostly it's Veronica, what's the stuff that's going on with Veronica in, in my book. Uh, the, the investigation side with uh, Jughead and Betty, I thought, was not quite as strong as it could have been. But uh, the, uh, the stuff with the Goblin King and Ethel was uh, suitably creepy. Um, <clears throat> I, I am digging what's going on with like Archie deciding, like, okay, well, we're busting out of this joint, I've had enough, and where he just, like, gets that bottle of booze for winning the fight, and then he sees it's, like, from some sort of uh, vineyard or whatever that belongs to Hiram Lodge, and he just, like, snaps. I mean, Hiram really is the cause of basically so much misery in Archie's life. It's sort of like, yeah, I made a blood oath with this guy, he backstabbed me, he's tried to destroy my town, he's tried to have my dad killed, uh, oh boy, it's going to be fun when uh, Hiram and Archie uh, confront each other. And uh, remember, the one time they did have a physical fight, uh, albeit a wrestling match, Hiram won. Uh, but um, while Hiram's an in-shape dude, Archie's been forced into like, you know, training in prison and doing bare knuckles fights. I totally want Ar Archie to physically kick Hiram's ass. That's going to be great. Uh, Archie <laughs> is... Uh, Honestly, not smart enough to take Hiram down socially and politically. That's going to totally be on Veronica, Betty, and Jughead. But, yeah, uh, Archie is definitely owed a physical confrontation at this point. Um, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Um, oh, yeah, so <laughs> it really is kind of funny. Uh, in a weird sort of way with Penny, Peabody, and Sheriff Mineta showing up, basically trying to extort Veronica. And she knows perfectly well that her dad is doing this just to sort of try and get her to cave. And Veronica handles all of that quite adeptly. Although I couldn't help but watch this whole, these interactions with her, and it's just like, you know, if she'd had a wire, she, well, she probably couldn't have gotten them sent to jail, but she definitely could have gotten Mineta and Peabody in some pretty hot water. Uh, Mineta, he probably could have tap danced his way out of that one, but Penny was blatantly engaging in, in extortion. And again, Hiram's a pretty connected guy, but still, that would definitely have been enough to get um, probably some a serious shot at her getting, her getting her disbarred. I mean, not that it particularly matters at this point, Penny's more basically the leader of the ghoulies in a lot of ways. Her uh, being a lawyer is just so much gravy, so she can maybe occasionally do stuff to try to keep the ghoulies out of jail to some degree. <clears throat> but yeah, it, if Veronica had had a wire, she could have definitely gotten those two in some pretty hot water, and all she really would have had to do was just stick that up on YouTube. I mean, it hit, he even pointed out, like, yeah, I wouldn't go and mess around with the local law enforcement who I know are in your pocket. I'd just send all of this to the feds. And, you know, that's one of the, the dangers, but yet also beautiful things about modern society is that if somebody sticks this up on the Internet where everybody can see it, then, yeah, you, you know, there is no, like you see on Facebook, you know, like, spread this around before it gets taken down. Like, man, that's not how the Internet works. The internet is forever. You know, people can like go out and delete old things, but you know, other people can take screenshots, download things. Yeah, the internet is forever. Uh, and uh, if there was significant pressure from outside of Riverdale, focusing in on two of his little minions, that would definitely be a serious problem for Hiram. And I, from what I've seen online, I'm not the only person who was very suspicious of that portrait that he uh, chose to give Veronica. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Hiram himself stuck a bug of some sort in there. But I guess we'll have to see. Um, moving on to the Midnight Club. Now this is one that I really enjoyed. Um, of course you have uh, all the main actors playing the, their parents of the same gender. 
Um, Mur, uh, I always get his name wrong. Uh, the fellow that played Hiram Lodge, his son, who is a who is actually a pretty minor kid. Young Hiram is played by the act, like real life Hiram's act, the actor who plays Hiram, whose name I cannot forget, I cannot remember. Uh, that's his actual real life son playing young Hiram, which is uh, quite cool. Um, and now, of course, this is all a big nod to the Breakfast Club, like the promotional poster they created for this is a direct uh, homage to the poster for The Breakfast Club, which, if you don't know, is one of the seminal movies of the 1980s. And it's basically the go-to how to make a high school movie for basically anybody who wants to make a high school movie. I've seen the movie several times. It's, it, I mean, it, it really is really, really good. <clears throat> and it's basically been an enormous influence on basically any other kind of teen drama that has ever come after it. And this, remember, this is something that was from like 1984. So it's literally had almost 40 years as an extremely influential movie. Um, so the them kind of going back into this and like, telling us, seeing us that time, which is sort of weird because if you do the math on things, this should be sometime in like at like the early to mid 90s. And yet a lot of, as people have pointed out, the music seems to have come from the 80s. A lot of the clothing and stuff even wouldn't have been that out of place in the 80s. But Riverdale exists in this sort of weird, not specified, like weird mix of time periods, uh, a lot like Gotham does. So it's just kind of one of those things that uh, you kind of just have to go with. But boy, it, it was really fun. And just seeing these characters, I mean, it all really does shed an enormous amount of light on their parents. And you really can't help but think, like, this is something that's been true since the beginning of the series. And you go back and you look at all the interactions between the adults and the idea that, you know, at one point, these guys were all actually pretty tight friends. I mean, we know for sure that, that you know, that people had relationships and had known each other for a long time. Uh, but still, it's interesting to see that, you know, people who have literally tried to murder each other, or, well, Hiram tried to kill Fred, or have, have a dude kill Fred. Uh, yeah, they, like, went to school together. They knew each other. Uh, it didn't look like Fred and Hiram were pals. We only really get to see them kind of briefly together. But s still... Well, actually, they were pals. They kind of joined their great friends and gargoyles groups. But yeah, um, it is it is kind of sad that, you know, the everything could have been so different. Uh, and I really like the, uh, the, the new things that we learn about people, like uh, Penelope. Like, she was basically selected as a kid to be Clifford's what future wife, even though they were raised together basically as brother and sister. I mean, holy crap, that's messed up. And, I mean, everybody understands that, like, holy crap, this is messed up. But, as she herself says at the end of the episode, like, you know, this, this is the only home I have. And, you know, it definitely does a lot to make Penelope a lot more sympathetic as a person. You know, she seems to have been, you know, maybe a little bit uptight, but ultimately was probably a pretty decent person, but just too many years around these messed up people turned her into one of them and really kind of makes you go, whoa, when you stop and think about like what might have really been going on behind the scenes with Cheryl and Jason's relationship that maybe never quite came to the forefront. I mean, I don't think anybody was planning to do anything weird there. It was basically stated that Cheryl and Jason were like biologically twins, but still that weird vibe between the two of them suddenly makes a lot more sense now. And, you know, so does Penelope's ruthlessness. <clears throat> um, Sierra, you know, when she was young. It's interesting that she is basically, they're playing, I mean, Deep Griffin's Gargoyles is an obvious nod to, uh, to Dungeons and Dragons. And, uh, I mean, I, I've played more than my share of D&D over the years. Like, Sierra's class is called the Siren, which is an obvious nod to Dungeons & Dragons' Bard. The Bard is a character that really focuses on an attribute, uh, Charisma. And, 
you know, you usually think of a bard as somebody who plays music, which is, of course, Jody's shtick. But bards also excel at social interaction, persuading people, which, you know, as mayor was a big part of what Sierra did. And, oh yeah, let's also remember that uh, Sierra more or less took bribes from uh, Hermione and Hiram. Suddenly, that scene takes on new context. And uh, Fred's character, for example, is basically a paladin, you know, the sort of the upright champion of justice sort of characters, which again keeps is in keeping with Fred being an extremely moral guy and Archie also being most of the time a really moral guy. Um, oh yeah, and man, so much respect for KJ Aber and Chris Sprouse in this episode. They really, really did uh, uh, the best job of sort of mimicking the older actors who who they're playing the younger versions of. Especially KJ Aber, he has Luke Perry's body language so nailed. It was it was amazing. Um, and uh, there's the whole thing like you know, Kev Kevin's dad and Sierra. You know, they had a thing in high school. Now their careers got messed up as adults because they renewed that. Um, I mean, there's just so much to unpack here. Um, one thing that I thought was particularly interesting was seeing young Hermione and her whole thing of like, you know, I I want to I want to break rules. I I admire her for you know being a go-getter even though when people point out that her definition of go-getter is him uh, basically being a thief uh, you know Alice's narration says that Hermione started you know down this road of many many compromises uh, because of uh, her relationship with Hiram so again this sort of shows that Hermione knew what kind of guy Hiram was pretty much from the start. I mean, he, he was still in high school, so obviously he wasn't like a mob boss who was ordering people murdered, but she knew that the, he was a thief and basically what sounds like a little thug, but she went along with it because she thought he was an ambitious guy who could get her out of Riverdale. So again, this continues my I am not the least bit sympathetic to Hermione thing at all. Especially when, like, she... She kind of whines like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm I'm your father's prisoner," or uh, you know, and then again going along with her being the right hand man or the Casaliagri or whatever the hell. She knew what she was signing up for, and she just continued along down that path. So yeah, no sympathy for me for Hermione from me. And uh, you know, people have pointed out that this episode does cause more than a few continuity clashes. Um, and, you know, th th those are fair points. Uh, I think, though, we just sort of have to accept that Riverdale is a show that perhaps is not super concerned with uh, the finer details of continuity at times. And that's not always the worst thing in the world. I mean, if there's if you're going to do something cool, but there's like a throwaway line for something that wasn't super important from a f previous season, then I can't blame a show for this, like, Eh, whatever. We've got this cool idea. One sentence from like three years ago contradicts it, so, but let's forget about that. Now, granted, there are times when this seems a little bit more important than just a throwaway line, but again, I, I, I think I understand the writer's attitude in this situation. Uh, I don't think there's this like enormous master plan of things laid out for, uh, for a show like Riverdale. Uh, let's see. Uh, now, what is interesting to me, though, is that this kind of continues with one of the, th the main themes of this show, and that it's been that ultimately when they figure out who the big bad of the season is, it turns out to be one of the parents. In the first season, it was Clifford who killed Jason. In season two, it was Hal who was the Black Hood. Well, Veronica's dad has been a source of uh, many bad things from season one. And uh, there's definitely going to be some sort of serious reckoning for Hiram this season, one way or the other. But that just sort of begs the question. The Gargoyle King existed back in the 90s, engineered the death accidentally of, of uh, the old principal. And boy, how, how would they have not heard about this? 
like the old school principal was found dead in the school closet because his body was rotting. Holy crap. Uh, yeah, that would be like urban legend uh, number one in a town like Riverdale. And it wouldn't be an urban legend because it's totally true. There's no way every kid would not in that town would not know that happened. No way they would not know. Uh, but whatever. Um, anyway, I mean, they kind of, I guess it's clear that the, the, the Gargoyle King was somebody who was then back in the 90s. And they're there now. So is it one of the parents? who did that back in the 90s, and now they're back p picking up where they left off again? Or is it possible that there were there are two? You know, somebody who was the Gargoyle King back then, and maybe they have a kid who has picked up that baton. I mean, it's been made very clear, like, Griffins and Gargoyles mania was all over Riverdale High in the 90s the same way it is now. If uh, somebody had a kid who picked up the baton, well, that would be really interesting. And having two major bad guys in a season would be really interesting. You know, parent and child bad guys. But again, who could it be? Well, if it's going to turn out to be somebody who's like a minor character, like, I don't know, Dilton Doily's dad or something, well, yeah, okay, who cares? But, hmm, so much, so much, so much. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, anyway, guys, I'm going to call it here. So, uh, as always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi and also join me on Tumblr at Jedi Reviewer. Until next time, take care and have a good one.